Tyler, thank you as always for uh, wonderful music. Thank you for getting us started this morning. Um, it's good to see some visitors here. It's always great to have some new smiling faces to look at. So let's read these verses uh, together this morning. First Peter chapter 3, we're just going to read verses 21 and 22. That's our text this week, and if you're able to, please stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Verse 21 says, Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the fact that you have chosen to save us as a result of the fact that you have conquered the grave. And we thank you for the fact that your love that, that took Jesus to the cross that your love provided a way out for us, that our sins can be completely forgiven, and that we can be in the presence of a holy and perfect God. And so we thank you, Father, for the, the miracle of the resurrection. We thank you for the fact that the world, many, many people all across the world today are celebrating your resurrection today. And we just pray, Father, that... Um, that you'll receive all the glory and honor we committed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be Amen. seated. <clears throat> well, since we took a brief detour for Palm Sunday last week, I wanted to go back and review just a little bit, and we're not going to take a long time in this, uh, just so it might be a little bit fresher for you. You can look back up in verse 20. You can see some of this. I'll come back to that in a second. But I, I just wanted you to see that, uh, or, or think about this for a second. But before Jesus was raised from the tomb, the, the Jewish sacrificial system involved the slaughter of millions of animals as sin offerings. Roman tells, Romans tells us that the wages of sin is death. And millions of animals paid the price for the sins of humanity. Jewish people were literally soaked in blood throughout their lives as they went through the sacrificial system, realizing that the wages of sin was pretty easy for them. They could see that it caused death. They could also see that God was willing to provide a substitute for the sinner. But there never was a substitute whose work ended the sacrifices until Jesus came to the earth. He died like all other humans. And when that happened, the sacrifice of animals ended, and it's still gone. In fact, Gail once asked a swimming, uh, a swimming coach who was Jewish how they handled the issue of sin today. And his response was very simply, we don't really think about it. Well, you can imagine that puts people in a rather precarious situation, does it not? Ignoring sin is the same thing as rejecting Messiah. But that's the way they answer the question. When Jesus died on the cross and made the final sacrifice, the temple area where the Holy of Holies was is torn in two. And remember, only the high priest back in, in the Old Testament, up to the point of, of Jesus' resurrection, only the high priests could enter the Holy of Holies to perform these sacrifices. Regular folks were forbidden. There never needed to be another sacrifice because the sacrifice of Jesus happened once and it never needed to be repeated. And yet... Keep in mind as we sort of think through all this that everything revolves around the fact that sinful people must be made right with our holy and perfect God. And someone has to die for those sins. 
If the bad news is that the wages of sin is death, the good news is that Jesus died to remove our sins, which gives us the reason why we celebrate Easter. And this is the most wonderful news of all time, and it is our cause to celebrate. If you experienced anything during Good Friday, if you went to a, a particular service somewhere, you know, Gail and I have a, a tradition in our house, we watch the movie The Passion of the Christ, and have, have our hands just kind of gripped into the, the seats while we're watching through that. But if you experienced anything at all, then it should be the realization that he died for our sins. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. So his sacrifice was not only for everyone, it was not only universal, it was ultimate. Now on the surface it's hard to realize why he had to die since he committed no sin. But he was our sacrifice. He substituted for us, and that substitution satisfied God. It was his propitiation that offers eternity into heaven. But only to those who trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Now, some versions will say that Jesus died, and some selected the softer, softer word, suffering. And as we look through this, we're reminded that this matter of suffering for doing what is right among an ungodly and hostile society means we must keep our focus on Jesus, who shows us how to deal with unjust suffering. When he was abused, he did not abuse. When he was unjustly criticized, he did not return that favor. When he suffered, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. And our goal then is to respond to our trials the way that Jesus responded to his. He was quiet, yet confident, and he graciously responded to his attackers while obeying and fulfilling the mission of the Father. That's how we're to respond, even when our flesh wants something else. And yet these last two verses of this chapter, not only does Peter want us to respond to trials the way Jesus did, but he also wants us to see that our Lord won a victory in his suffering, and we can as well. The intent of this passage is that there is victory during trials, and that the death of Burial and resurrection of Jesus is a powerful example of that victory during trials. Let's look first at a victorious safety. Victorious safety. Now one of the problems, as I mentioned a minute ago, with skipping a week is that we've kind of forgotten what we read just a couple of weeks ago. So some of this will appear a little disjointed because it stands alone. So just look back at verse 20. We see that Noah's salvation, this is Peter's example here, Noah's salvation was through water. And here's the connection to verses 21 and 22. Remember, Peter and Paul wrote and thought completely differently. Paul is much more structured, much more orderly, much more outlined. And I've remarked often that he reminds me of an attorney or someone in a debate trying to anticipate objections from his opponents, and he answers questions that sometimes have not even been asked. Peter, on the other hand, if a thought came to his mind, he wrote it down. And remember when we studied the letters from John, how he would introduce several topics, then he would swing back around and he would go deeper the second time, and then he would swing back around and he would go even deeper to it on the third time. They would come back around, and he kept that, uh, and kept that going. So a completely different style that's going on here. Peter takes a shotgun approach. He's a bazooka. He just lets it rip. But he wants us to understand here that Christ died for sins and he died unjustly. Unjustly. He didn't deserve to die. But even in being treated unjustly, he triumphed through the resurrection and is at the right hand of God and all those demons who created his suffering in the first place are now subjected to Him. His point that concludes this great chapter is that Christ, even though suffering unjustly, was victorious. 
He suffered for doing what was right, and God caused him to triumph. A marvelous and a glorious triumph. Now back to Noah. The waters of the flood floated the ark and rescued him and his family, but those same waters destroyed the rest of the godless world. And we went over that a couple of weeks ago, just how godless the society around Noah was. However, there's a connection here with water. And he makes sure to clarify his point, as we'll see shortly. Look in the very first part of 21. It says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. So if Noah's salvation was through water, so was ours through baptism. Now, please don't get ahead of him on this. <coughs> Notice the clarification that he makes very quickly. Baptism doesn't send anyone to heaven in and of itself. If that were the case, then listen, everyone who swam in a pool would be a Christian. And I trust you can hear how absurd that is. And besides that, it is impossible to guess at how many people have been baptized in a church just like this one that we have behind us. And we're not truly saved. It's impossible to calculate that. The numbers today are staggering as to how many people from Generation Z and the Millennials have made public professions of faith in Jesus as children and even been baptized but chose to walk away from the faith when peer pressure got the best of them. So we have to understand, he's looking at this symbolically rather than literally. Now remember, when we see, we see scripture and we, we see symbolism that's involved, we, we have to ask, what's being represented? Or our analysis is going to get heavy, it's going to get confused. <laughs> Peter even uses the phrase here, corresponding to that. Now again, we started with that, which makes it a little rough. But it, it helps it make, when you look back in verse 20, it makes the connection with Noah. This is what he's talking about. Word for corresponding here is almost exactly the English word antitype. It is used to describe a copy or a representation. It refers to a person, a place, an action, or a thing that anticipates or foreshadows a more perfect fulfillment of the optimal idea. Now that term is, is used in the New Testament basically to convey the idea of an earthly expression or a heavenly reality. It's a symbol or a picture or a pattern or an analogy of some spiritual truth. The fact that eight people, we, we saw this a couple weeks ago, eight people were in an ark and went through the whole flood judgment and yet were untouched is similar to to the Christian's experience in salvation today. So you have to ask, did the ark save Noah? Or was it the water? Well, the answer is really neither. God saved Noah. God saved his family. God saves us today. Now understand this, please. Whether, whether it's Noah's worldwide flood or the baptism of a single sinner... It's the power of God that saves people, not water. Baptism just gets you wet. It's a symbol of the fact that you were once in bondage to sin and powerless to resist it, but you repented of your sin and you begged God to forgive you and you dedicated your new life to following the teachings of Jesus instead of the promptings of the flesh. If you want to emphasize the water, you can, since water is gender neutral, and so is that Greek word for antitype. The real idea here is, as these people in the ark went through the waters of judgment, and the believer is likewise carried safely through the judgment of God. And as a result of that, baptism therefore saves people. Because you just you can't get there. In and of itself, it does not. It comes as a result of faith. And if we substitute the word immersion, <laughs> we can get a little bit more close to it. We can kind of sneak up on it. 
And since I've mentioned that baptism in and of itself doesn't save anyone, you know, I think he's talking about immersion into an ark of safety that went through judgment. He's saying, just like Noah was placed with his sons and their wives in an ark of safety, and they were preserved in it, then you've been immersed in some kind of a protective ark that has taken you through judgment. They were put into the waters of judgment. The waters of judgment fell on top of them while it was raining for 40 days and 40 nights, but they were protected in that safe haven. As believers, we're also put into the great waters of judgment. And we too are protected in a safe haven. Now, if you leave out that qualifying statement there in the middle, what you have remaining is, and corresponding to that, baptism now saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These other statements that are in there are qualifiers. It's the baptism that saves you. The baptism into the death and the resurrection of God. As that flood was a, a furious judgment of God upon the earth in Genesis, as it killed everybody on the face of the globe, and yet eight people lived through, though they were immersed in it, they were immersed into an ark of safety. And so the judgment of God came upon Jesus Christ. Now follow this. <clears throat> the judgment came upon Jesus Christ, and you went through that judgment in Him, but you survived. Protected in the ark, who is Christ, the ark of safety. And you went into his death, burial, and out again in his resurrection. That's what he's saying here. He says, I'm not talking about a water baptism, either literally or metaphorically. It is not the removal of dirt from the flesh. I'm talking about you. This is what he's saying. I'm talking about you by faith, coming into union with Christ, undergoing the judgment of God that fell on Christ in His death and burial and coming out on the other side, which we read about Noah a couple of weeks ago, in the glory of His resurrection. And therefore, you too have been carried through the judgment of God and out on the other side by being protected by Christ, the ark of safety. He's speaking about this wonderful immersion into Christ. And when we baptize folks, we quote Romans 6, where Paul talks about being buried with Christ in his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Raised in his resurrection. It's the same idea. Alright, let's move on to the second part of verse 21. We'll see a victorious salvation. A victorious salvation. Second part, beginning... Uh, in, in 21, the second part says, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now this word appeal is the, is the word that's used as a technical term for making a contract or a pledge. Agreeing to certain conditions of demands or a, as, as those of you who are taking the Hosea class are familiar with, this is a covenant. And here it says, that what places you in the ark of safety is an agreement to certain conditions regarding God. It's a confession of faith in desiring a covenant with God. It's an appeal to God for a clear conscience. Sinful men have only an evil conscience. The point here is that the sinner becomes sick of sin. He wants to be delivered from the burden of sin and from the consuming anticipation of final judgment. He wants to have a clean conscience. The writer to the Hebrews wrote, chapter 9, verse 14, it says, The blood of Christ will cleanse your conscience. So he's saying here that what puts, up, puts you into Christ is not a water baptism. What puts you into Christ is a pledge to God, an appeal to God for a clean conscience. So in other words, it's a pleading to be forgiven for your sins, which is also called repentance. Since baptism doesn't save you, what does save you is the immersion into the ark of safety, who is Jesus, in whom you go through the death, 
burial and resurrection and the judgment of God falls on the ark, but not on you. What saves you is a heart longing to be delivered from the crushing burden of sin that plagues, plagues your evil conscience and wants to covenant with God to live an obedient life. It leads you through the judgment and out on the other side through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that completes the salvation victory. And man, you talk about a victory. That beats winning the Super Bowl every year. Because it's eternal. Peter makes sure that we're clear that he's not talking about some kind of ritual. The word baptism means immersion. immersion. So it could be taken metaphorically. Because you could be immersed in your job or your marriage or your grandchildren. You could be immersed in anger. You could be immersed in joy. And what saves you is an appeal to God for a good conscience. And that can come only from receiving God's forgiveness, which can come only from repentance. Some of you may be able to recall being criticized and accused. Some of you can remember experiencing the guilt that comes along with sin and simply wanted a clean conscience. It's a fresh slate. That's available, but only through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, you recognize Jesus died for you and he rose again, and that's the provision of salvation. And the sinner comes and says, God, through the work of Jesus, clean my sinful heart. And God, in his grace, places you in union with Jesus, and literally you go through judgment in him. The judgment of God falls on Jesus. He's the ark. It hits him from every direction, but it never touches you. You literally go through the judgment of God in Christ like Noah's family went through the flood. In the end, the judgment is over, and then you step out into eternal life. Death, then, is really simply the ark of Jesus Christ that bridges this world with the next. And that's why we're not afraid of death. You just heard as we were, we were singing hymns a minute ago, one of those had, had lifted the words, Charles Wesley lifted the words of the Apostle Paul. Oh death, where is your sting? Oh, oh grave, where is your victory? Amen. If you're headed to heaven because of the work of Jesus Christ, because of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and because of your faith in Him, you have no fear of death. Amen? Amen. Jesus removes all our reasons to fear God because of our sin. Jesus takes our sin upon Himself in satisfying the justice of God. And we fear God because, listen, nobody who truly understands hell really wants to go there. You see jokes about it all the time. I can't find anything funny about hell. Jesus rescues us from hell and he announces a victory over it. Jesus is our ark and then he takes us through the judgment into eternal life. Smart people have a healthy fear of God, but the same God who is our enemy, your enemy, until you surrender to Jesus. The same God who judges our eternal position loves you enough to have provided a way of reconciliation. He loves you enough to tear the curtain to the Holy of Holies and invite you through faith in His Jesus. And then you can run into God's presence. So you think back into those, those days from the Old Testament and even up until the time of, of the resurrection, you weren't even allowed into the Holy of Holies. Now you can run into His arms and you can jump in His lap and refer to Him as Abba Father, which is, you and I might say, Daddy. It's a loving expression. You can, we can run into His presence. All fear dissolves in a sense of dread and terror. 
I mean, how wonderful is it that God goes from being the enemy of those who have not trusted Him to being the loving Father of those who have? But only through Jesus can that occur. He alone is the one who paid the price for sin once for all. And it's applied, as I said earlier, only to those who believe. He's the one who, who won the victory over the forces of hell. He's the one who makes death a welcome transition and not a frightening event. This way the victory belongs not only to Jesus, but for all who trust Him. Now let's look at verse 22. We'll see the victorious submission. Victorious submission. Verse 22 says, Who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to Him. What a, what a glorious final note of victory here. Who is at the right hand of God? Throughout the Old Testament and on into the New Testament, and all throughout eternity, eternity the right hand of God is always seen as, as the seat of highest preeminence in the place of strength and honor, authority, and power. When Jesus had accomplished His work on the cross, He was exalted to the right hand of God, the place of prominence, the place of honor, majesty, authority, and power. And we have more details available than what Peter gave us here. Hebrews 1.3 says, And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That particular writer uses the scene of resurrection and ascension to note that Jesus is better than the angels. And just a few verses later, we read where angels worship Jesus. And when Jesus entered the glory of the presence of the Father after His resurrection, when He ascended to the right hand of, of God, He did so as the Supreme One. In fact, this is a frequent theme of the book of Hebrews. Here's one, Hebrews 10, 12. But He, that's Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Now that fulfills Psalm 110, written roughly a thousand years earlier. Hebrews 12, 2. You may be familiar with this one. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen? Amen. Numerous times it says He went from the cross to the right hand of God. Romans 8.34, Paul writes, Christ Jesus is He who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. He died, but He was raised. And He went to the right hand of God where He's given all authority over the angels and over all created beings. Some of you may remember a couple of years ago we studied Philippians, especially chapter 2. His position is indeed exalted. Verse 5 talks about Christ and His humiliation. Verse 8 refers to the response to His humiliation and His death on the cross. And then verse 9 concludes that because of His death and His burial and His resurrection, God highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As the praise chorus goes, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. He will be called Lord, and every knee shall bow. Now look at this next phrase, having gone into heaven. Acts 1.11 says he was taken up into the air in a cloud into heaven. Back into Hebrews. Hebrews 8.1. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest 
who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And then a little later, Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. When Jesus went into the grave and out of the tomb, he ascended to heaven. I see the victory in that submission. Every knee bows to him. He's interceding for us because he was willing to submit himself and God highly exalted him. And because he suffered, his victory ranks him above all other beings. This last verse continues. After angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Now that looks back not only to the moment that he descended from the pit and declared, which we saw a couple weeks ago, and declared his triumph and announced his victory, but also to the fact that it was through the cross and the resurrection that all angels, or as they're called here using two other terms for angels, have been subjected to him. All ranks of spiritual beings are subjected to Jesus Christ because Ephesians 1, 20 and 21 tell us which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in the age to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. It was through his suffering and the obedience of suffering that God highly exalted him. Every being is hupotasso. You remember those of you who took marriage without regrets with us. Common biblical word for submission. It's a military term. It means to line up in rank beneath him, but it's always a voluntary sort of thing. Peter's asking them and us to understand that our unjust suffering is the path of victory. It was for Jesus, and it will be for his followers. Romans 8, 17 says, and if children, we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified in him. It is for us through the path of suffering to reach the place of glory as it was for him. Now remember the words of Paul to Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.10 for this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we die with Him, we will also what? Live with Him. So the path of glory always takes us through suffering. And there's no better example of suffering than the Lord Jesus. Philippians 1.29 says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Paul also put it another way. 2 Corinthians 2.14 Thanks be to God who always leads us in His triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. The passion of the Christ was ultimate. The passion of the Christ paid for sins. The passion of the Christ was never to be repeated. The passion of Christ was a mission accomplished. Jesus opened the way to God. Symbolically, God demonstrated that when He tore the veil of the temple from top to bottom and opened the Holy of Holies for immediate access to everyone. All believers now have the direct access to the Father as a result of the suffering of the Son. The purpose of His death and His resurrection 
was to reconcile us to God. Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. There's no one else who can introduce you to God other than the man Jesus Christ. Oswald Chambers, the great Scottish theologian of the early 20th century, summarizes the cross by saying the cross was not something that happened to Jesus. He came to die. The cross was his purpose in coming. God came in the flesh to take sin away, not to accomplish something for himself. The fulfilling of his destiny gives him the right to make us sons and daughters of God. And what his resurrection means for us is that we are raised to his risen life, not our old life. He will always cause us to triumph. Even as Christ triumphed in the midst of unjust suffering. He tri triumphed over sin to bring us to God. He triumphed over all the spirit beings that would stand against God and his people. As it were, put them in, in their place. He provided an ark of safety in order that he might triumph over the judgment of God. And he entered into the supreme place at the right hand of God. Don't underestimate the potential victory that could come with unjust suffering. It may be that when you suffer unjustly, you too might have the opportunity because of how you take that suffering to lead someone to Christ. It may be that when you suffer unjustly, the Lord will give you great and glorious victory over the demons with whom you wrestle. It may be that when you suffer unjustly, that you win the respect, not only of skeptics, but of co-laborers who have endured similar sufferings. It may be that when you suffer unjustly, you might become a source of inspiration <coughs> for someone else who sees how you weather that storm. You can count on the fact that you should suffer, should you suffer victoriously. The Lord will exalt you and lift you up. Don't despise the suffering. Remember the victory of Jesus and keep your eyes focused on Him whose faithful and loving journey to the cross will lead us to victory in Him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we do pray that uh, in this time of decision, if there's anyone here who, or, or listening over the internet who has never trusted in you as Savior and Lord, I pray, Father, that through the miracle-working power of your Spirit that you will draw them to you in a saving fashion. I ask, Father, that uh, it, even it, our church, our little church here is one of countless numbers of churches across the world who are pointing people to the cross this morning. But more important than the cross, they're pointing people to the empty tomb. The fact that you won a victory so that we can spend <coughs> eternity in your presence. I ask, Father, that all across the world, all across the globe, as people are searching for answers to unjust suffering, I pray, Father, that they will consider the man Jesus, who, while we were yet enemies with God, Christ died for us. So I pray, Father, that there will be people who will accept you as Lord and will surrender to you and follow your teachings for the rest of their natural lives. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark and Taylor are here. They're going to lead us in a couple of verses of a hymn of invitation. If there's any business that you need to do with the Lord, any business you need to do with the church, you just need to get right, I'll be down front. While they play as they sing, we invite you to come. Page 